Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, good to have you all back again. Another break, and we'll pick right up where we left off after the last half hour. But for those of you out in television, Iris wants me to let you know we still have the one and only book we've ever published. And uh, anything more on it? You don't want to put a price on it, do we? Okay, we've always, uh, we might as well. We've advertised them at 11 bucks. We still haven't changed, and uh, we've... Uh, Sold thousands of them. A lot of people use them like a tract. You'd be amazed how many people buy and uh, just hand them out like a tract. And they are. They're, uh, they've been a good vehicle. Okay, thanks, Herb. All right, for those of you joining us on television, again, we're just a simple Bible study, and uh, most of the time we go verse by verse. So uh, somebody asked me one time, how can you get by without using notes? And I said, all I do is read. <laughs> So <laughs> who needs notes to read? So anyway, that's the basis of, uh, of our teaching. We just simply take it verse by verse and uh, then look at some cross-references as well. All right, we'll pick right up. We left off Daniel chapter 12, and uh, now verse 5. <coughs> I've been sitting here waiting and debating in my own mind whether I should come back and, and do a little more in verse 4, but uh, I think I'll let it go for now. Now, verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two others, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Now, whenever you read things like this, especially in the Old Testament, and I've been sh sharing this with people more and more lately, we have to understand that when God was dealing with Israel, the supernatural was commonplace. Always remember that. When we read these things and the scoffer says, who would ever dream of anything like this? No, not today, because we're not programmed for the supernatural. We're not supposed to be. But Israel was. Now, all you have to do is, is just go to the very beginning of Israel's existence. Uh, Joseph was already having his dreams that were, were supernatural in content. Coming out of Egypt, just a total miraculous removal of several million people with their little ones and their livestock out of an enemy environment across the horrors of the Sinai Peninsula. And yeah, I feel Mount Sinai was over in Arabia. And then the miracle, I think we mentioned it in our last taping, there is probably not a greater miracle in all of Scripture other than the things pertaining to Christ himself than the opening of the Red Sea. I mean, what a fabulous miracle that was. How that these several million Israelites and all their livestock are standing on the shores of the Red Sea in a dilemma. What are we going to do? And what did God say? Find driftwood? <laughs> build boats <laughs> he said stand still and god opened the red sea now that had to be over a period of miles for that many jews to go across on dry land and yet the timing was so perfect that all the hosts of the egyptian army coming upon their be upon their rear now and then the timing that god opened the red sea the Israelites could go through, and by the time the last Israelite is going out on the east side of the Red Sea, the Egyptians are coming in from the west, and when the last Egyptian is inside <laughs> the shores of the Red Sea, here comes the water again, and God got every one of them. You know, when I was a kid, I used to hunt, and you know, my buddy and I, if we saw three or four ducks or something, we liked to get all of them. Well... <laughs> God did. He got every one of them, <laughs> including the king, see? And so what a miracle. What a miracle. Well, all through Israel's history, you see, it's miracle after miracle after miracle. So even coming all the way up to the angelic announcement to Mary, did Mary pass out with fear when all of a sudden an angel is standing there speaking to her? Of course not. That wasn't all that unusual. 
And then you come in even to the book of Acts. Peter's in prison. Well, who comes and opens the door? An angel. Well, you see, that's the supernatural that we're not accustomed to today. All right, so now the same way here. When we speak of two personalities standing on the river and speaking on the river, don't be surprised. It's a supernatural thing, see? And the same way, as soon as the, the miracle of the rapture has taken place, even the beginning of the tribulation cannot happen without the supernatural power of God bringing Israel and the Arab world together in a treaty. It could not happen today. I don't care how many great men would try it. It'll never happen until it's time for the Antichrist to occur. And so always remember this, that in Israel's dealing with God, the supernatural is commonplace. All right, so look at the uh, verse again. I saw one man clothed in linen, verse 6, who was upon the waters of the river. And he said, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Now, these are not pleasant wonders. These are horrible wonders. It's the final judgment of God on God-rejecting humanity, see? All right, then the other one said, I heard the man clothed in linen who was upon the water river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, swore by him that liveth forever that this period of time should go for, now I'm in verse 7, it'll go for a time, one year, times, plural, for two years, for a total of three, and a half a time. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all of these things shall be finished. Now, I'm going to take a little time here. I didn't intend to do this, but let's go back again to pick up the timing of these seven years. Now, maybe we should go back first. Let's go back a minute to Daniel chapter 9. Just in case we've got some listeners out there that have just tuned in and they've missed these previous programs, and I'm sure there will be some, and it never hurts to repeat anyway. But come back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, where we have the proclamation of a 490-year period of time prophesied on behalf of the nation of Israel. Now that's down in verse 24. <coughs> Seventy weeks of years, or 490 years total, are determined upon thy people. Now, see, there is an instance again. Israel is still out in unbelief, and God doesn't call them my people. But to Daniel, he can say, thy people, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, in other words, the work of the cross, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, you see, there's our timeline that we put it on the board in the first half hour. Exactly repeated again. Coming out of the Old Testament, in would come Christ's three years earthly ministry, his crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension, and then in would come these final seven years, the worst of which will be the last three and a half, triggering, triggering then the second coming. I should put that up there, I guess, so that people will know what we're talking about. This is the second coming. And he'll come to the Mount of Olives, and that will usher in then, of course, the king and his kingdom. All right, so all the Old Testament speaks of it in that line. And like we said in that first half hour, there is not one mention of the church age. That chalk isn't much good, Jerry. You've got to get a different one. Okay, now then, go back with me to... Uh, verse, or on down rather, to verse 27. 483 years of the 490 will be fulfilled at the time of the cross. All right, but we've got seven years left. We've only fulfilled 483. There's 490 total. Now we pick up those last seven in verse 27. And he the prince that shall come up in verse 26, which is a reference to the Antichrist or the son of perdition or all the other terms the scripture puts on him. But he will confirm or make the covenant with many for 
one week, seven years. And in the middle of the week, so isn't this a scriptural amazing thing? That from the very time that we see the first mention of the time, the seven years, it's immediately split in half. Right from day one, the scripture divides these seven years into half and half. All right, so here it is. That in the middle of the week, at the end of three and a half years, he, this Antichrist, this son of perdition, shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to stop. Now, you remember when we were looking at this several programs back, I asked the question, how can you stop something if it hasn't started? So we know from this verse that Israel will have a temple rebuilt as a result of the treaty, and they will enjoy temple worship for three and a half years. Then at the end of the three and a half years, the Antichrist will go in up there, I think, on the Temple Mount, will go into that rebuilt temple and defile it and turn on the nation of Israel like they've never been persecuted before. It'll be awesome. All right, but here is the basis of our seven years. And in the middle of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to stop and for the overspreading of the abominations, that is the wickedness that's going to come on the planet, he, the Antichrist, shall make it, the temple, desolate and it'll remain desolate until the consummation of those seven years. All right, now then, just to pick up again, I think we did this way, way back, but come all the way up to Matthew 24, once again, we looked at it in the first half hour, Matthew 24, verse 15. And here the Lord Jesus himself now starts at that midpoint. So he too is looking at the seven years in two sections, the first half and the second half. All right, verse 15, we know it's the middle because he speaks of what the Antichrist has just done, the temple. So when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now I do that emphatically to impress on everybody that the Lord Jesus himself puts the stamp of approval on Daniel's book. And that's why we can take it as authoritative as anything can be. All right, now he says, when you see that happen, Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Now then, from 16 until through verse 20, we have a description of this escaping remnant of Jews out of the area of Jerusalem and Judea to a place of safety. Now, we don't know where it's at. A lot of prophet people think, prophecy people, think it'll be the city of Petra over there in Jordan. And I won't argue the point. We've been there and I've looked at it in that light. Yeah, it could be a very good place for them to encamp because not only does it have all the caves and so forth in the, in the limestone mountains, but there's also huge flat desert areas where they could encamp. Now, you've got to remember that, again, supernaturally, God is going to protect that remnant of Israel wherever they are. Now, lest you that's think that's a stretch, go back to Egypt because a lot of these things in this seven-year period are almost a deja vu of the Pharaoh and the plagues of Egypt. Now, if you remember at the end of the fourth or fifth plague, God put an invisible fence around Goshen where Israel, of course, lived and the plague did not touch them. Now, always remember that. That's where it first started. I think it was the, fl the plague of the flies. I'm not sure. But whatever it was, not a bit of that plague entered in to where the Jews were living. And Egypt was decimated by it. Well, he's going to do the same thing now for this last half of the tribulation. Wherever Israel is led, God has a place prepared for them, as we'll see in Revelation. There will be an invisible protective wall around them. And none of the horrors of the tribulation will touch them. And that's going to be a supernatural, supernatural event. But it's going to happen, see? All right, so now then the Lord speaks of these 
surviving Jews who will flee to the wilderness. Now, we'll just go over them quickly. Uh, we've done it many, many times. But verse 17, let him who is on the housetop, who I've always referred to as probably wealthy, retired people living on their penthouses or whatever, and they are warned to not take even time to go and find something that they would like to hang on to of their possessions. The main thing is to get out of Jerusalem. All right, verse 18, we always look at as the working class. Whether it's professional people, whether it's physicians or university people, or whether it's business people, these are in the working area, the income people. And he says, take them and do not go back and get your clothes. Because you want to remember, at the time of Christ and the time of Scripture is written, Israel was an agrarian nation. 90% of the people made their living herding sheep and farming and orchards and so forth. Only a small percentage were business people. So that's why the term here is, let him who is in the field. It's an indication of the working class. All right, so they are instructed not to go back and get extra clothes. Then you jump into another segment. Now, the reason I do this over and over and over is because so many people think there's only one remnant of Jews in Scripture, and that's the 144,000. No, there's two remnants. This is the remnant that will become the seed stock of the nation of Israel in the kingdom. Now, if you're going to have seed stock, and I use that word, I think, correctly, you have to have male and female. They're going to reproduce. They're going to have families. Well, you see, the 144,000 are all young men. So it just doesn't make sense that they are the remnant that's going to reestablish the nation. This is the remnant that will do that. It's a cross-section. You've got men and women and children and babies, see? All right, read on. Woe unto them that are with child, see? Little ones that haven't even been born yet. And then for those that are nursing, mothers who have already got one or two kids at their side. And so you've got a whole cross-section of a society right here in these few verses, and these are going to be the Jews escaping to that place of safety. All right, now then, Jesus, we've already looked at it. Verse 21, Jesus announces that this three and a half years will be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. It's going to be awful, beyond human comprehension. All right, now then, let's pick up, since we're dealing with it, let's pick up this escaping remnant, clear back in Revelation, and we can also depict the language of the three and a half years as Daniel used it. And that'd be Revelation chapter 12, honey. Revelation chapter 12. Now this for sake of time, just drop down to verse 5. The first three verses just establish that the woman is a symbolic picture of the nation of Israel. Now in verse 5, she, the woman, Israel, brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now that's the way Scripture works. That's speaking of the kingdom, when he will establish his rule and reign of the nations. Now it'll be a rule of iron because of its absolute authority but it's going to be a benevolent rule. In other words, there will be nothing that will hurt. There will be nothing that will cause sorrow or turmoil. And so even though it's an absolute rule, it's a righteous rule, as we see back in Isaiah 11 and other places, and it'll be a heaven-on-earth existence. Now, I can't repeat it often enough because, like I say, most of Christendom never hears this. But this coming thousand-year kingdom over which Christ will rule and reign, Israel is now the major nation. Now, that goes back to Deuteronomy 28. You will no longer be beneath, you will be above. You're not going to be the tail, you're going to be the head. You will not borrow, you will loan. See, Israel is going to all of a sudden make a complete inversion 
of where they have been all through history. And that'll be because their king is the Messiah, but all the other nations of the world will become operative. All right, now then where is it going? Revelation 12. So the woman, the nation of Israel. But now remember, you haven't got the whole nation. You've only got a third. Remember when the first half hour this afternoon we went back to Jeremiah that, or Zechariah, that one-third will escape death? All right, I think that's this segment that's going to flee out to this place of safety. So, she, uh, verse 5, she, uh, I should finish that verse. I'm sorry. Verse 5, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, but a benevolent. Her child was caught up unto God, speaking of Christ, when he came and went back to glory. Now verse 6, and the woman, this escaping remnant of Israel, the woman fled into the wilderness. Now we don't know which wilderness scripture is talking about. Where she has a place prepared of God. Now take that slowly. What does that mean? Wherever God is going to lead them, he's already got it all ready. In other words, he'll probably have places of abode where they can, where they can dwell out of the heat of the desert sun. He's going to have all of their infrastructure that they need for sanitation and all these things. It's all going to be ready for them. And let God be God. He doesn't take 10, 12 months to do something. He can do it instantly. But it's going to be ready for them when they get there. All right? And it should be prepared of God, and he's going to feed her or supply all her needs for 1,260 days, which is how long? Three and a half years, see? 1,260 days and uh, 42 months or three and a half years. All right. Then let's drop all the way down to verse 14. Now, this is the way Scripture works. And unless you know how to study, you'd never figure this out. Now we're dealing with this escaping remnant fleeing out of the area of Jerusalem. Men, women, children, nursing mothers, expectant mothers, a whole cross-section, see? All right. Uh, verse 14. And to the woman, this escaping remnant, were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, the one that the other verse said was prepared of God, or that she might go to her place where she is nourished or fed or provided for in every need for one year plus two years plus a half year for three and a half years from the face of the serpent, that is, from Satan and the man Antichrist. All right, now just to show you <coughs> what I said a moment ago had more clout to it than you had any idea, that the exodus out of Egypt was almost a forerunner of this for the escaping remnant. Come back with me to Exodus chapter 19. <coughs> exodus chapter 19. Now I know for some of you, you've heard this over and over. For some of you, maybe you've never heard it before. And if you haven't, you like to have it repeated. So that's why we do it. Exodus 19. And they have just come out of Egypt, and they're encamped around Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up into the mount. Verse 3. Exodus 19, verse 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now look at verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. I explained that already a moment ago. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now stop. Has anybody ever told you that they sprouted wings and flew from Egypt to Sinai? No, of course not. What did they do? They walked. The scripture is evident how they walked. And with all their herds and their flocks, 
but I have to feel it was some sort of a miraculous speeding up somehow or other as only God could do because they had to stay ahead of Pharaoh and his army and they're on horseback. So whatever. It doesn't mean that they flew, but it was a supernatural working of God that they somehow covered the territory probably in less time than would be ordinary. But that's all that you can put on it. Now the same thing then in Revelation 12, 14. The same scenario. As they're fleeing Jerusalem, they're either going to be on foot or maybe in vehicles or whatever, but however they go, God is supernaturally going to enhance their travel. And let God be God. Let him do it any way he wants. All right? Now then, if you'll come back to Revelation, verse 15. Now again, here you have to kind of interpret a little bit, and I just use common logic. We know that the Antichrist is now ruling from Jerusalem under the power of Satan, and so he immediately, when he hears of this group of Jews fleeing to whatever place they're going, he immediately sets out a command to have some military organization pursue them, whether it be a battalion or a regiment or a company, I don't care what, but he's going to send some military operation to pursue these Jews, just like Pharaoh and his army pursued the Israelites in the Exodus. All right, now look what happens. So the serpent cast out of his mouth waters a flood, and I maintain it's a military command to go after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of whatever he's telling the military to do, to either mow them down machine guns or bomb them or whatever, destroy them. But, you see, about the time that military contingent catches up with the tail end of the escaping Jews, God does another miracle. He opens the earth. Well, you remember, he did it back with Korah in the Old Testament. All right, and so that whole Antichrist military operation will sink into the opening earth. All right, now I'm down to seconds. All right, so when he hears what happens, verse 16, the earth helped the woman, opened her mouth, swallowed up the flood or these military uh, pursuit, which the dragon cast. Now then, verse 17, the dragon was angry with the woman, that is, with Israel, went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments and so forth. Who Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.